You're listening to CRST, the podcast from Bryn Mawr Communications. Welcome to CRST, the podcast. I'm Morgan Micheletti, a cataract and refractive surgeon at Berkeley Eye Center in Houston, Texas, and I'm excited to be your host for today's episode. We'll be discussing a topic that can be challenging for many cataract surgeons, but is so important in today's modern era of cataract surgery, and that's IOL exchange. This subject was the cover focus of the February issue of CRST, for which I had the privilege of serving as the guest medical editor. Joining me for this discussion are two of my esteemed colleagues, uh, friends, and and even a mentor uh, who contributed to the February cover focus, uh, Drs. Gary Wartz and Brian Schaefer. Thanks, Morgan. Uh, Yeah, this is Gary. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here and share a little bit of my perspectives. Thank you so much, Morgan. And Gary, I'm always so happy to talk to you. This is Brian Schaefer. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. It's one that keeps me up at night, not always for a good reason, but it's such an important topic right now. Completely agree. So in this episode, we'll dive a little deeper uh, into into IOL exchange and different pearls. Brian will share some pearls in particular about uh, performing IOL exchange in, in more complex settings. And then we'll dive a little deeper into Gary's innovative ideas for the future of IOL exchange and explore how they could transform our approach to refractive cataract surgery. So let's get started. Uh, Brian, you know, we we perform cataract cataract surgery and then a lot of times patients um, may, not a lot of times, but every now and then a patient may need an exchange for one reason or another. What are some of the, what are some of the things you think about when, when you're first looking at exchange, whether it's the IOL type, I mean, how's your approach depending on the IOL type in, in general, um, maybe how do you talk to a patient or counsel a patient about, uh, about an IOL exchange? I break it down as follows. Is this person getting an IOL exchange because they're not happy with the current IOL technology that's in their eye? Are they getting an exchange because there's something wrong with the IOL that's in their eye? Or are they getting an IOL exchange because the IOL that's in their eye is completely dislocated? Depending on which of those situations it is, what we do is going to be entirely different. So let's start with the first one. That's kind of the simplest. We're exchanging an eye well because the patient is not enjoying the technology that's in their eye, whether they have a monofocal in their eye and they want to move to a multifocal or vice versa. We know that with all of the different advanced optics available to us now, there are patients who will not be happy. And it's hard to know with certainty who that's going to be. So in that situation, it's not straightforward, but more straightforward than if there is a zonulopathy, an open capsule, so on and so forth. In that situation, it's a matter of getting the IOL out and putting a new IOL in. I'm going to focus more on the more complicated issues here. I'm going to talk more about the cases where there's either a problem with the IOL, let's say it's a hydrophilic IOL that's opacified, a silicone IOL that is calcified due to asteroid hyalosis. Most of the time in those situations, the posterior capsule is already open, or potentially we're dealing with dislocated IOLs. These are nightmare cases. They're fun for such a small segment of the ophthalmic community. And for the rest of us that do them, they are not necessarily fun. They can be rewarding, but even when we get them done perfectly. Sometimes they still keep us up at night. So here are some of my pearls for what to do, especially in the context of a dislocated IOL. First and foremost, confirm that that IOL is not fully dislocated into the vitreous or sitting on the retina before you start the case. Secondly, give a retrobulbar block or have this patient under general anesthesia. It is just always in your best interest to make sure that this patient is as comfortable as possible because there is a possibility that you're going to be passing needles through the eye or placing trocars and having that eye fully anesthetized is in your best interest. On that topic, I always place a trocar for posterior infusion with or without the plan for vitrectomy, depending on the status of that eye, whether it's post vitrectomy or not. But having that trocar place prior to doing anything really is so helpful because it can help prevent any pieces from falling posteriorly. Yeah, I com- I completely agree, Brian. That's that's something I do too, especially in this, you know, in particular in the setting of an open capsule. Are you placing a trocar on any other cases or are these only cases where you're talking you're talking about a dislocated lens or the setting of an open capsule? Any other times you would place a trocar ahead of time? I place a trocar in those two settings because 
The goal is to pull Vitreous back rather than let Vitreous prolapse forward. Our goal is to own that Vitreous and not let the Vitreous own us. And if we start to dissect the IOL away from the capsule and pull it anteriorly without posteriorly pulling back the vitreous, we by definition are going to pull vitreous forward, create traction, and increase the potential for tears and detachments. So that that can be that can be a real problem. And that's a great point. You know, a lot of a lot of times we talk about uh, an anterior approach, and I've I've done both anterior and and kind of a more uh, partial planar approach to these. But, you know, vitreous is hard to see, right? So you may think that, oh, I did a great job. I did a great anterior vitrectomy through my limbal incisions, but you created traction that you didn't know you created, and then a patient has a late detachment. So I think that's something that uh, is not often thought about a lot of times by anterior segment surgeons, but I think it's such an important point. Uh, and hopefully something we'll all continuing more, continue to learn more about uh, as, we, as we explore the middle segment. And a, and a shout out to to my good friend Christos Efantides with with all his work in that area as well. Um, so Brian, you know, mo- moving on to to the next stage. You said you had three different kind of uh, or a couple different um, scenarios. What, what what was the next one that you were going to walk us through? Yeah. So here is at those first couple of uh, pearls. There they apply to really any IOL exchange. Let's talk about the setting of taking out an IOL when the posterior capsule is open. At this point, you're going to try and preserve the anterior capsule. Let's say there's no zonulopathy. You want to preserve that anterior capsule as much as you can because at this point, getting an IOL out of the eye safely, not having vitreous prolapse, and placing a three-piece lens in the sulcus with optic capture is a fantastic result because now, especially with the option for the light adjustable lens, you still can have the opportunity to provide a premium experience for patients who want that. So in order to get that IOL out safely, we know that it's going to be socked into the capsule. That's just what happens. Fibrosis, it's going to be stuck there in the fornix. So what I do is I take, I dissect the anterior capsule away from the the IOL, the anterior surface of the IOL, with a 26 gauge needle bevel down on a dispersive viscoelastic. And I go around and I inflate the capsule away from the anterior optic until I have 360 degrees of lift around it. At this point, it is critical to decide how much zonulopathy there is. Because if there is any semblance of zonulopathy, when you go to remove that IOL, you are going to create more zonulopathy. So if there is some, place capsule hooks at that point. You never regret placing capsule hooks. They are your friend, and they really do replace the zonules to prevent you from having any iatrogenic zonulopathy. At that point, it's important to reinflate as much of the remaining bag as possible with OVD, whether it's cohesive or dispersive. I tend to use a cohesive at that point in time. And then the goal is to free the haptics. And what the main thing to take note of is that the place of fibrosis is going to be different depending on which haptic design you have. So if you're using an Alcon lens, the most fibrosis is going to be at the terminal bulb of that haptic. If you're using other types of lenses, it might be closer to the haptic optic junction. So placing a curved instrument like a Sinsky hook or a Hunkler and following the curve of that haptic all the way around until you get to the distal end of it and pulling inward as you go is what's going to free it up. And then once it's freed up, you pull it into the anterior chamber, cut it in half or remove it however you want. I prefer to cut it in half, pull it out of the wound. And now you can breathe a little because you've explanted the IOL. That's that's the the perfect way I think to approach these, Brian. And that's that's a lot of times how I'll approach them too. Is you know the first thing first is is dissecting the anterior capsule away, freeing those haptics. And I, I think the most tedious part is freeing the haptics, right? I mean that's that's by far and away the, mo- the the part where surgeons I think can get the most frustrated and start trying to move quickly. And that's when when a lot of times when I'm in, in talking to people, they get into trouble. You know, they're like, oh, I thought the haptic was free. And I kept pulling on it. And then, you know, at least in the setting of a, of a intact posterior capsule, they either tore the bag or in an open posterior capsule, they lost zonules. And now they're having to suture in a lens or, or come up with, with, you know, some other alternative means of fixating a lens. 
and, and I'll let me jump in here real quick, guys, because all the things you're saying can can happen in almost any situation. I mean, you can start off with a case with the capsule being intact, push your capsules intact and no sign of zonulopathy and where you start and where you finish can be very different. So these situations where you think this is going to be the most, you know, easy exchange ever, you know, Brian, to your point, you never regret putting in capsular hooks. And also I just want to know when do you guys, at what point do you say, I'm either going to cut the haptics or this lens is not coming out of the eye because it's going to cause more harm than good. I'd love to know what you all think about that. I have a pretty low threshold to cut those haptics. I had a, a dislocated crystal lens that was dead bag syndrome dislocated. So in those situations, they're kind of interesting because it's a dislocated IOL, but really you still have an anterior capsule intact. And in that situation, I, I was going from a intact anterior capsule to a very dislocated anterior capsule. And I just cut off those haptics and I did not regret that. Yeah. And what do you cut the haptics with? Cause I've, I've actually never had to cut the haptics out. It's probably just, I'm probably more aggressive than I need to be, but are you just using MST scissors to cut them or do you have a special scissor? MST. Yeah. Morgan, what's your threshold for cutting haptics versus either saying I'm not, you know, stopping and, and, and call, you know, just throwing up the white flag. Yeah, I've, I'm thinking back now. I think I've cut haptics in, in two cases. On, and really, it was only on one side. I was able to free one side, but not the other. It seems to be how it is in these cases, right? You can always you seem to always be able to get one side, but it's, it's the other side that's always sticky. It's fortunately not both. I wouldn't be in a real problem then. But, you know, if, if, if I spend some time dissecting away and I really track down the haptic, I think that's a, a great technique is to follow down the haptic with your visco cannula, Sinsky, you know, once you have the bag properly inflated, you can even have the patient look away from the scope and you can kind of angle in to try to visualize the haptic as much as you can. Um, but if you really can't, which I have in two, in two cases, I have cut the haptic. Um, the first time I cut it and it was still in the, you know, it's kind of funny because sometimes you can still see that haptic. It's still like just sitting there. And so I've actually gone in and even, and of course I wish I had this on video, but I had to go back in and retrim it after I got the new lens uh, new lens in because it's just sitting there and the new lens wasn't sitting right, but right. it's, it's a real problem in a toric lens, right? I mean, right. that's when you exactly. really, really have to get those haptics out almost. You don't have to, but I mean, it's a, to try to get it right back on the same axis, that's, it's, it's a struggle, right? So you, you, it's, it's a, I, I fortunately have not been in that situation. Have you guys been in that situation where you've had to cut the haptics in a toric? I've not. I'll say one thing about that. So when cutting, after cutting the haptic off, it's much easier to take that haptic out of the eye because when you're trying to get the haptic, when you're trying to free the terminal end or the terminal bulb of that haptic while the whole optic and the other haptic are still there in the bag, there's a lot of hardware in the eye at that point. That's when you get into trouble. But after amputating, especially the Alcon lenses, after amputating at the haptic optic junction, for whatever reason, it's much easier to follow the curvilinear pattern of the fornix of the capsule, and it tends to come out a lot easier. It's harder to do that when the, eye, the whole IOL is in the eye. So trimming the haptics and then taking them out is not that difficult and frankly can save the day. Maybe there's some other things in the future that can that can help prevent uh, that capsule from from scarring down. So maybe yeah. that's a good segue, actually, Gary. Why, sure. why don't you tell us about your thoughts about the future of IOL Exchange? Yeah. So this is a project I've been working on, and you know, full financial disclosure, I've I've uh, principal in the company Omega Ophthalmics. We've been working on a, a new intracapsular implant that essentially keeps the capsular bag open. Um, I feel, I feel like we are all sort of in this epidemic of patients deciding after surgery that they regret some decision that they made before they had a chance to experience uh, the results of their lens. And I don't know how we get around that. I know that the light adjustable lens, which we have just recently acquired uh, that technology, that's a great way for patients to sort of fine tune their vision. But I'm, I'm almost having this epidemic in my practice where patients are just changing their mind on the fly all the time. And it, it can go, it used to just be multifocal to monofocal, but now I'm having patients who are having monofocal regret. They're talking to their friends who had a multifocal and they're wanting to try a multifocal after cataract surgery with a standard implant. 
Um, I'm having patients who I'm taking out a multifocal and putting in an EDOF. I'm going EDOF to, mono, to multifocal. It's like going every possible direction. And guys, I don't think this is going to be slowing down anytime soon. And it, it seems like the life cycle of new technology just continues to speed up. And so I don't personally put any, any premium IOLs in today that I was putting in probably five years ago. Um, and then probably in another five years, I won't be putting in any of these lenses. So there's almost like this idea of an obsolescence that every five years we sort of get a new generation. But we know the lenses we put in now, essentially, most patients are going to have to live with. So the idea of the Gemini capsule was really just to prevent the capsule from collapsing. And there's this concept of capsular collapse syndrome. And in the article in CRST that I, I talked about, basically there's three, um, essentially there's three core issues with capsular collapse syndrome. First is you lose accommodation. You know, I believe that when you take out the anterior rexus, you know, the anterior capsule, you're sort of losing that counterbalancing force for accommodation. So when the capsule collapses, you know, you, you lose accommodation. And so that's, that's number one. Number two, when you lose capsular volume, um, you, you're going to have some variability in your effective lens position, which is going to ultimately affect the, the um, precision of your outcomes. Uh, but also it's, you know, that space is really important. The capsular, you know, the, the lens capsule is the thickest basement membrane in the human body. And it's also been demonstrated to be the one place uh, in the eye that can safely hold implants. So we have this really privileged space with no nerve endings, no blood vessels, um, if we can keep that space open, not only could we, you know, leverage it for patients uh, today, but we could also, you know, obviously give them chances for better technology in the future. And then, you know, the last thing is capsular fibrosis, uh, including PCO and anterior capsular opacification and phimosis. So all the things we're talking about with lens exchange, these are all a function of a lens that is just a different size, shape, etc. and material than what we were born with. And I think that until we as ophthalmologists say, you know, we think that, you know, there could be a better way for us to help our patients and our patients are really kind of demanding it at this point, um, you know, it, it, until we really tell industry you know, we, we want more options, we're going to be stuck in the current paradigm, which is putting in a flat foldable IOL with C-shaped haptics and letting the capsule collapse around it. So anyways, getting back to the Gemini capsule, the Gemini capsule is basically like this three-dimensional silicone donut that goes in the capsule once you've taken the cataract out and you've removed the cortex. And it basically is like this liner. It's self-expandable, so it keeps the capsule bag open. And then once that is in place, you can put whatever IOL you want inside of it. You can put a lens behind it. You can put a lens behind it and inside of it. You can even do three lenses. You, know, you can put drug implants in or other technologies. But the whole point of this is if the patient has cataract surgery today and they decide at some point that they want to try a different lens or the lens that you implanted, they're not happy with, because you don't have the collapse of the capsule around the haptics, you can easily remove that lens at any point down the road. Um, we also feel like potentially it could prevent, um, you know, phimosis and with phimosis, you know, possible late dead bag syndrome or, or um, zonulopathy that can occur from purse stringing of, of the zonules with, with aggressive phimosis. So we feel like there's a lot of um, possible future applications. We're super excited about it. We actually just had a patient um, from one of our trials, two years after the trial was completed, uh, the patient wanted to try multifocal lens. And so two years post-op, we actually did, we didn't, but it was the, the original implanting surgeon took out the monofocal, implanted a multifocal. It was as if the lens had been implanted yesterday. So, you know, Brian, imagine if we had this opportunity where no longer are we trying to, you know, tease these haptics out and, and preserve zonules. We could literally just pull the lens out from this protected environment. We can really do whatever we want. I think that's what patients are going to want down the road, whether it's our designer or anybody else's. I think this idea of keeping the capsule open could be really powerful. This is so amazing, Gary, and it would be such an incredible game changer for our patients, for us as ophthalmologists, and for industry. And there are so many patients who come to us now 
younger and younger having cataract surgery. And I worry a little bit when I go to put a diffractive lens in that eye because we reserve diffractive technology for pristine eyes, which our 50, 60 year olds often do have. I almost never see a pristine eye that's over the age of 70 or 75. And I worry like what's going to happen to this diffractive lens 20 years from now. Right. Well, if we had the ability to easily swap that out down the line, that is a huge win. Well, and we think about, you know, eyes are dynamic and changing, right? Just like you said. So just because someone doesn't have macular degeneration or glaucoma at 50 when they're getting a refractive lens exchange or early cataract surgery, we just don't know what technology is going to be best in, you know, throughout their lifetime. And this would actually allow a patient to adapt and, and basically us give them the technology that's best for them as their, as the technology improves and as their eye health might change. Yeah, it's a, it's an incredible concept and kudos to you for taking it all the way and actually having developed it and have it in patients. I mean, that, that it's, it's amazing that a patient has actually gotten to benefit from that technology already with that, with that recent exchange. I mean, that's, that's truly amazing. Something you came up with is it changed the life of a patient today or a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Right? I mean, that's, that's awesome. Well, it, and, and what's really frustrating probably, and you know, you sort of see the problem, you see the solution. And now it's like in my own practice, I know that this is the future. I know that this is what I would offer my, my family members if they were coming in for cataract surgery, this is what I'd want for them. And it's, I don't know how you guys feel about this, but it's just so hard to explain to someone in words, what their vision is going to be like, even explaining sort of loss of contrast or glare and halos at nighttime, daytime vision being different. It's really hard to explain in words what their experience is going to be like. And there's always some level of disconnect where a patient will say, I didn't, you know, you told me this, or maybe they don't even remember you said it, but the experience is much different than what they had envisioned in their mind. And so that's where it's just, it puts us on the hook as ophthalmologists. You know, we're the ones who ultimately are left holding the bag when a technology doesn't work inside of a patient. And so for me, you know, I sort of think about this, this Gemini capsule, um, sort of like a seatbelt. You know, I put my, I put my seatbelt on every time I leave my, you know, my driveway, not expecting to get into crash, but boy, if I get in a crash, I'll be glad I have the seatbelt on. I think the same thing happens or needs to happen with lens platforms. Again, whether it's ours or someone else, we need to be able to have some sort of built in system where if a patient doesn't like their IOL, we have a really easy option for them to, to switch the technology out. That's a great point. That's a great point. Cause right now, you know, the, the stress is all on us as surgeons and, and by putting this device in, we can offload a lot of that stress from our techniques and, and skill sets into a device, essentially, right? Exactly. Exactly. And, and Brian, imagine a patient doesn't even have a capsule, they're aphakic. And uh, now you can actually restore, you know, some sort of capsular bag by doing a scleral fixation of a prosthetic bag. You know, think about the options that presents for patients. You know, you're talking about these patients who have calcified IOLs or dis dislocated IOLs. You know, Yamani is great, but it's a monofocal IOL, right? It's so funny you mentioned this. I was, I'm in a big text thread with all of the cornea fellows from my year of cornea fellowship. And the current conversation is about a IOL exchange or a sutured in Vista, I believe it was, that ended up being measured perfectly, but still had a little bit of tilt on it. And my comment, and I've talked to you about this before, Morgan, as well, we have somewhat different feelings about this, is I generally don't feel confident enough when doing a secondary IOL, specifically a dislocated IOL, or a sclerally fixated IOL. I don't feel confident telling a patient that I'm going to deliver some sort of refractive result. I do a bunch of these. I probably do five plus a month. And I still am not that predictable. My standard deviation is too large. Your effective lens position, your tilt, all of these things can happen regardless of how good your technique is or how often you've done it. And to have the ability in the future to potentially put a scaffold in place and then adjust based on your known effective lens position, that would be a huge win. Well, and also the IOL is no longer fixated to the sclera. So that if you had to change out an IOL because it's the wrong power or tericity, you know, you still have the full complement of lenses that you can place inside of there. And again, 
these are boutique cases, of course. It's not, you know, this is not going to help any, you know, strategic really increase your stock price. But for a patient, this could really matter. And that's where I look at these products that sometimes it's hard to say, well, what's the business case for this? Well, as a physician, the business case is I want my patient to have options that they currently don't have. And, um, you know, that's where physician innovation is sometimes a little bit different than industry led innovation, because we see the problems that we deal with and we develop solutions for the things that are real in our world. Um, sometimes that doesn't always translate, but um, I'm so excited about this. And, and other solutions, because you guys, this is not going away. It's not getting, it's not going to get easier. And the conversations and the, and the choices are going to get more and more complex. And we're going to have to have more and more IOL exchange conversations with our patients as time goes on. You know, I, I think that the ability to, to do this is so important for all cataract surgeons that are implanting uh, any sort of advanced technology IOL, because you know, it is a relationship between the, the patient and the lens. And it's a tough one sometimes to land the first time. You know, like you said, Gary, it's it's hard to put into words what all the things that they're going to experience will be. And I think that overall, we've covered a lot of great ground. I mean, Brian, you walked us through uh, some, some great tips and techniques on dealing with IOL exchanges and open capsules and zonulopathy. Uh, and you, you gave us some, some insight into how you prep the patients from anesthesia uh, to, to how you talk to them. And that, so that was awesome. And then Gary, you gave us a glimpse into the future of IOL exchange and, uh, and, and where we're going and giving patients more, uh, more flexibility in the future and giving surgeons more flexibility too, right? So surgeons who may not have been so comfortable with IOL exchange as it is today may feel more comfortable doing so in the future with, with these new devices and techniques. So that's all the time we have for today's episode of CRST, the podcast. I want to extend a special thank you to our guests, Drs. Gary Wartz and Brian Schaefer uh, for sharing their expertise on IOL exchange. So before we wrap up, I do want to remind our listeners to please visit the CRST website for more information on this topic. Uh, please go back and, and look at the February issue of CRST where these fabulous physicians and surgeons that we've had here today uh, dive into a lot of these uh, topics in more detail. Uh, and please take a look and, and we'll see you guys again soon. For more shows like the one you just listened to, check out the podcast channel on itube.net.